view on ideas. And, and also if, if it's okay, as, as you said, if you have any spontaneous questions, you can interrupt him. And we also have a thought questions and answers after this lecture. We hope to around eight or 7.50, we have a short break and then questions. But okay, welcome Ricardo. Thank you so much. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you, Goran, and thank you all of you for uh, being here to take into consideration this uh, theory that I've been working on for the last uh, uh, 15 years, basically, but that uh, I've been able to wrap up in the present version only lately, only in the last five uh, or six years. So, uh, basically, I'm after the, the problem that you're probably at the center of your interest to, namely the nature of uh, consciousness, the nature of our own experience. And uh, as you probably know, I mean, this problem, there's no need for me to uh, state the obvious, this problem is at the center of uh, neuroscience today. And it is something that neurosciences are completely unable to explain. How is it possible that uh, something like a brain is able to produce anything like our own conscious experience so if we look inside a, a body inside a brain this is just a vax reproduction but it's a nice one it gives the idea what we find is completely different from uh, the reality uh, from the reality of our own experience inside the body the properties of the stuff that we can locate inside, for example, a brain is completely different from our own uh, everyday experience of the world. There's nothing like ourselves in the brain. And uh, notwithstanding this fact, neuroscientists have kept looking inside the brain and looking for uh, some mysterious properties that is somehow produced by the brain. They kept peering inside the the neural activity in the hope of finding something that may look like our own experience. So, for example, if we take this uh, um, diagram from uh, a famous uh, book by Christoph Koch, who is a famous neuroscientist in the field of consciousness, who is now working with Giulio Tononi, we see the traditional approach in neurosciences. Namely, we have the external world, for example, a dog or trees or whatever there is in the environment. And then we receive light through the uh, uh, eyes. The eyes transmit some kind of uh, um, signals to the brain. And then inside the brain, we have uh, neural activity, which is usually correlated with our own experience of the world. Problem is that science stops here. Science stops here because we are not able to go any further than correlation with neural activity. And the neural activity that we have here, as you can see, is completely different from our own experience of the dog, of the external world. So in our own experience of the external world, in our experience, we don't find anything like the brain. The picture that neuroscientists have been after can be represented with a, a, a drawing that I find it quite convincing that shows this picture that is uh, that's like an allegory where we have the external world that is received by means of information which is colorless then it is somehow processed in, in in the brain and somehow like a digestive system it is finally able to produce the mind this allegory is uh, taken from authors like george miller who spoke about informavores he said that our brains are um, informavores in the sense that they eat information and then they transform the information in our mental representation but as i said at the beginning, and I don't think I need to stress this point too much. In the neural activity there is of a brain, there is nothing that uh, resembles our own experience. If you uh, read any recent paper from neuroscience, you will see that the paper starts by saying that at, so far, no 
a scientific theory is able to explain how the, activi the neural activity is uh, transformed into our own experience. For a simple fact that this is a physical object with physical properties inside a body. This object has its own physical properties. And that's a fact, that's a fact so obvious that it wouldn't need to be stated unless, like most neuroscientists, we keep desperately looking for an explanation as to why inside this object there is something completely unexpected, namely our experience of the world, which is completely different. Right now, for example, I have a window next to me. I see the trees, I see the clouds, I see the sunset. I see many things that are utterly different from what's going on at, in this very moment inside my brain. So, how can we solve this problem? There are basically, so far in the literature, there have been two options. Here I am very uh, speaking very, very by very in a very approximate way. But so far there have been two options. The first option has been to suppose that somehow inside the brain, here inside the brain, there is something completely unexpected and invisible, something like an emergent property which may explain our experience of the external world. So far, nobody has found anything like that. So far here, neuroscientists have found only neural activity, chemicals, neurotransmitters, synapses, glia, that kind of stuff, which is completely different from my own existence. You may be surprised, but until I read about my brain, I had no idea what's going on inside my brain. I was utterly ignorant about what might happen inside my brain, but I was completely competent about the external world. I had an experience that was completely fine about the world that is made of objects, clouds, trees, mountains, and everything else. The other option, of course, is to suppose that there is some kind of psychic substance, something like the soul, something that is not made of the, of the same uh, stuff the brain is made of. And this is uh, the dualistic view. For example, as in the case of the card, the idea that there is an immaterial mind that is somehow connected with the brain and by means of the brain with the world. That's not altogether possible, but it would not be so simple. It would not be so consistent with science. So I, I spent my, my research activity looking for a third alternative, looking for a third, another option that does not require to add anything to the physical world, but that is compatible with the fact that in my experience, I find the world and not the brain. So let me put forward the basic hypothesis behind my work. The hypothesis that I call the mind object identity theory. And I will soon explain why it is called like that. So let's consider a simple case of perception, the simplest possible case of perception, a standard case of perception, as when we perceive an object. If you know me, you know that my favorite object so far is the apple, but we could do that with any other object we may like. So right now, in front of me, in front of my body, there is an apple. And the apple is a physical object. Now, right now, 
what I have an experience of. I have an experience of uh, a red, round, shaped, shiny object, the apple. If I watch inside my brain, do I find anything like the apple? No, I don't find anything. That inside the brain right now, there is nothing which is red, round and shiny. But is there in this moment, not very far from my brain, something utterly physical, but with the right property, something which is red, red, sorry, red, round and shiny. Yes, there is. It is the apple itself. Now, as strange as it may seem at first, there is no reason why we should continue to think to be located in the brain. We can take into consideration the possibility that the very thing that we are is not the brain. It is the apple. Why? Because it has just the right properties of my experience. At this very moment, so imagine for a moment that the scientists had been able, which they have, hadn't, but let's suppose for a moment that scientists had been able to find out that whenever we perceive an apple in the world, we had an hologram, a red hologram of the apple in the brain, which is not true. But let's suppose for a moment that they found something like that, that whenever we have an experience of the apple in the external world, in the brain, there's a small chamber, holographic chamber, where incredibly a red, an, a red hologram of an apple is created. I am sure that if neuroscientists had found anything like that, they would be uh, already in Stockholm asking for the Nobel Prize. <laughs> And they would claim that that copy of the external app, apple is the experience of the apple. Unfortunately, or fortunately, they didn't find anything like that. They didn't find anything like that. The brain remains like the brain. But let me ask you, why should we be located here? and not there, where is the object? So that's in a nutshell, the hypothesis that I ask you to take into consideration, no matter how strange it may seem to you at first. The hypothesis is that we are not made of the material inside the brain here but we are made by the material that is in the world, there. Now, why do we have to believe to be inside the body? What are the empirical reasons to believe that we are located inside a body? I think that we don't have any evidence. What the main reason why we think to be inside a body are survival. The body is necessary for our existence. So we need to take care of the body. But that doesn't mean that we are inside the body. That only means that the body is necessary. Second, social pressure. When we need to locate someone, we point to its body. When our parents started to, uh, let's say, call us when we were just the babies, kids, they started to point towards our bodies. And so we believed to be that object they were pointing at. When my mom or my dad started to call me, Ricardo, Ricardo, they were always pointing at my body. So I believed that it was the thing they were pointing at. Third reason, what Daniel Dennett, the philosopher, called the center of perceptual gravity. What is the center of perceptual gravity? Well, most of our sensors 
are located the mouth, the tongue, the ears, sorry, the ears and the, the eyes are located in the head. So the world where we live in is like a donut centered around our body. But let's look at the body again. Is the property of what we find inside the body alike the properties of what we find inside ourselves? I don't think so. Actually, I know very little about what's going on inside my body. Yes, occasionally I ate too much. And I definitely have a sensation that I put too much inside my stomach. Or occasionally I had a, a, a toothache or my heart is beating too fast. But this is very little compared to what's going on inside my body all the time, of which human beings have been completely oblivious until a few centuries ago when um, Vesalius and other famous doctors started to peer inside bodies. But, and even more interesting, there is a part of our body that is in, utterly impossible to experience in any way, to the point that if a surgeon, let's hope not, has to reach that part of the body, and if the surgeon is able to anesthetize all the rest, there's no need to anesthetize that part of the body because we are completely oblivious to it, the brain. It is impossible to have any experience of the brain. So there's nothing in our experience that is related with the properties of the very object that neuroscientists keep telling us we should be identical with. That's quite surprising to me. And that's why, as strange as it may seem, I'm asking you to consider this possibility that from the start, we have never been inside the body, but we have been only in the world. We have been one with the world. After all, let me ask you for a moment. When people ask you, look inside yourself, where do you look? In which direction do you look? That's a completely metaphorical direction. And what do you find? If you, I ask many times to my students, look inside yourself and tell me what do you find? And they tell me, I find my girlfriend, my boyfriend, my house, my car, my money, what I read. And then I tell them, no, 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 that's all stuff that it was outside your body. I want you to tell me, something that is completely inner to you. And they say, well, my thoughts. And then I say, well, speak me about your thoughts. And then they tell me, well, I've been thinking of um, my degree. And they say, no, 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 the degree is something which is outside again. Is there anything which is completely inside? Can you tell me, for example, a color? that you've never seen in the world. Can you imagine a color that you've never met, that, you, that your eyes has never seen? And they said to me, no, we cannot. I worked a lot with, with um, uh, congenitally blind subjects in Italy, and uh, they agreed with me that even if they're extremely proficient, skilled, uh, speaking about colors, they can speak about colors with an incredible uh, uh, competence. And I, 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 I even know a congenitally blind subject living in Bologna who loves to write uh, poetry about color. But then he, he, he confessed me, I have no idea what I'm talking about, but I know that the grass is green, that the sky is blue, and they like so much to refer to these entities, which for me are completely, uh, have something magical about it, them. But of course, I have no idea what a color is.
and it appears that the congenitally blind subject are unable, for example, to dream of colors if they were really totally blind and really congenitally blind. Then there were a few um, hybrid, vague uh, uh, cases where they haven't been congenitally blind from the start, so they may have some kind of memory. So, to cut a long story short, I am suggesting a third alternative. So, according to this uh, hypothesis, we are neither a brain nor a soul. We are a world. Which world? The world in front of our um, body. So, what is the goal of the body in this picture? What does the body do? And why is the body necessary? So, the metaphor that I would like to, to use is the metaphor of the dam. You see, I put a brain here. And I put the object there with the lake. What do I mean with this metaphor? I mean that the dam is responsible for the existence of a lake. But the dam by itself is not the lake. And the dam is not able to produce water. If I build a one mile high dam in the desert, I wouldn't get any, any lake. In order to have a lake, I need rain, water, um, rivers, and a terrain like that. So I think that the brain has that role. Of course, if I damage the dam, for example, if I drill holes in the dam, the water would flow downward and the lake would disappear. So, if I made studies like neuroscientists who like to make damages to the brain and to find out, not of course to make voluntary damages to the brain, but you know, to study what it happens when a brain is unfortunately damaged, and they find out that if the brain is damaged, the world of one's experience is correspondently damaged or utterly destroyed. From this correlation, they claim that the lake must be produced by the dam. If they apply the same argument to the case of a lake and the dam, they could do experiment on the dam and they would draw the conclusion that the lake is created by the dam, like they do with the brain. They study damages to the brain or they change the way in which the brain works and they see that there are changes in the in one's experience but that doesn't show that the experience is in the brain or that the experience is a product of the brain or is emergent from the brain or is uh, uh, a, a, a located in the brain or even identical with brain processes it shows only that the brain is among the necessary but not sufficient condition to allow the world that impinges on the brain to exist, just like the lake. Now, so far, I, I, if there are any questions, please don't hesitate to interrupt me so far. The basic hypothesis is super simple. The basic hypothesis is to take into consideration the possibility that we are uh, broader than our body. That we are not just the brain or some activity inside the brain, but that we are the external objects whose existence is made possible by the brain. Why do I say that our brain makes possible the existence of the external world? For a very simple reason. So let me use also this objection that I made it to myself to uh, address one possible objection that is also one of the main reasons why people believe that we must be inside the, our brains. 
and this objection is the fact that the world appears different to each of us. So it might be that I am colorblind. So it might be that for me, I'm not, but let's suppose that I was, that this apple that I wear, that this apple, it may look of a different color to me. Or it may be that this apple to me looks very heavy. And for someone else, it may look very, very light. So in, in general, by and large, we have and each of us has an experience of a different world. How could that be possible if we were identical with the external reality? And that leads me to the question that I asked before. Why should the world be created or somehow take place because of our bodies and brain? And the answer is very simple. And the answer has been in front of our eyes all the time, uh, at least ever since Galileo. And uh, the uh, theory of uh, relative velocity. So let me ask you a question right now. So I, I'm as still as I can. Is this apple moving or still? Still? I think still relative to my body. Yes, yes. <laughs> but relative to the moon is moving at 1,700 uh, kilometers per hour. Yeah. Relative to the sun, I think it is moving at something like 800,000 kilometers per hour. Yeah. And so forth. So at, in, at this very moment, this apple is moving in all directions only we uh, experience only one direction only one movement which one the one relative to our body but no one claims in physics that this is the only um, objective velocity and that all the other velocities are just uh, subjective velocities in physics, we are perfectly comfortable with assuming that this object has at any time as many relative velocities as it needs. So if you take uh, any object here, the apple, you may see that uh, the apple may have different uh, relative velocities relative to, uh, to different objects. And that's completely fine with physics. Nobody in physics speak of uh, um, subjective velocities. Velocity is relative. And how many velocities do we have? As many as frames of reference. So the idea that goes with, together with the, my hypothesis is that the object is not absolute. The idea is that the object is relative. So the same object may have different properties relative to different bodies. Just like the same apple may have a speed of 40 kilometers per hour relative to a truck and a, a speed of 50 kilometers per hour relative to a car, so it might be that the same apple may have a certain color for a colorblind subject and a different color for a standard perceiver. You don't believe that? Let me make you an example that shows that the same object may have at the same time two completely different colors without even having to appeal to color blindness. Um, so let's take into consideration a, the white. Uh, on your computer screen of your phone. So you pick up a white patch on your computer, on, on your phone, on the display, on the screen of your phone, and you watch it. What's the color of uh, that uh, screen in, in the white patch? Let's take, you take a white icon. What's, what's its color? Well, its color is white. But what if you got closer and closer to the screen 
of your phone what would you see that's what you would see you will see the red blue and green buyer grid so at the same time the screen is both white and a, a color grid of red blue and green lights actually if you had a much higher resolution retina even without getting close to your screen you would see the buyer grid so is the screen of your phone white or is it uh, uh, like a grid it is both it is white relative to a human eye at uh, say uh, more than uh, 30 centimeter of distance and it is uh, um, a grid a color grid for a super high resolution eye or for a human eye at a very short distance few millimeters or less and that is just a, a physical property there's nothing subjective here my point is that i could go on well let, let me make you one, one more example that is nice to see uh well let me make you a moving example so this is uh, the sunset where i live you can see at the sunset that there is the line of the sun here how nice it is at the very place where i walk but now as you can see i moved i moved on the left if you move the camera together with the bystander you will see that the light of the sun moves together with you okay sorry sorry if i'm not able to catch the line so you can see that the 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 light of the sun is always in line with the bystander that's me by the beach and if you move it moves together with you what does it mean it means that actually all of the sea surface is shining and that the sunset and everything you see is what it looks like because it is relative to the position of your body in this case to the position of the camera that i put in line with the body just to make the point as clear as possible and uh, my point is that all the properties of the physical world are relative they are like uh, the, the the white and the screen they're like relative velocity they're like the sunlight they're like uh, for example just to make another example the rainbow in this case we have a car the car is moving you can see the the windshield it is raining and the rainbow is still but at any time since the car is moving the rainbow is made of different droplets of water so at any time we see a different rainbow how many rainbows are there in the cloud infinite just as many as the relative velocities of the apple just as many as the relative colors and i could go on forever i could tell you that all the properties that we find in our experience are physical relative properties relative to a particular object which object our body that's why our body has a fundamental role and it is necessary. It is the dam that keeps the uh, world from flowing down. So the body has a fundamental role. There's only one thing that the body cannot do. To be us. Because the body is the physical object with the role of uh, um, permitting the object that we are, which is uh, the apple, to take place relative to our brain and our body, which they work together. So the idea is that like the screen was white relative to a standard eye and was uh, red, blue and green relative, for example, 
to a super high resolution eye or that uh, like the rainbow or like the sunlight uh, on the, at the sunset or like uh, relative velocity, they need a frame of reference, a causal frame of reference. And this causal frame of reference, it's the body. Actually, everything we have an experience of is uh, uh, um, relative to our body. All the properties of the world we have an experience of are one way or another relative to our body. And we have no capacity to experience anything different. But now, and I, I'm moving toward the, the, the second objection. So the first objection was the one about the variability of the world, variability relative to different uh, subjects. I would like to move towards a second objection that is usually raised. The second objection is, but Ricardo, all this idea is, is a nice idea, maybe is a nice twist, you know, to, to change the, the center of one's existence from the body to the world. And to see the body just like the proxy of a world, which is interesting in my view, because it goes very well with my um, pre-theoretical insight that I am not my body. I never thought I am my body. I never be, I, I take care, I take good care of my body. I, I reasonably like my, not all of it, for example, I don't like my ears or other parts of my body, but more or less, I, I appreciate my body, but I never felt deeply inside myself to be one with my liver, with my lungs, with my heart, with my intestines, with my stomach, with my veins. Yes, of course, I have a very intimate relation with them. Of course, I perceive my body in a more intimate way than anybody else. But one thing is to perceive in, in a very intimate way a body. Another thing is to be that body. And they've never felt to be that body. So, the second objection, which is the main objection that usually people raises, raise against this view, is the uh, apparent autonomy of our mental life. Namely, dreams, hallucinations, um, um, illusions, mental imagery. Now, how can my theory, my hypothesis, uh, cope with the fact that uh, occasionally or every night we seem to be able to step into in, uh, uh, our dreams? into our uh, mental world. Isn't that the proof that we are creating a mental world, that our brain is able to create a virtual world that has no counterpart with the physical reality? Well, yes and no. Let me quickly provide you with an alternative view of, how, of what dreams might be, dreams and hallucinations. First of all, let me point out to you that even Descartes, René Descartes himself, observed that we seem to be unable, even in dreams, to create basic components out of which compose our dreams. What, what did he mean? He meant that although we seem to be able to put together properties we experienced in uh, standard perception, we seem unable to create from nothing a basic elementary phenomenal property. So it seems that we are unable to create, for example, a new color or a new taste. What do we do in dreams? We are like a painter who puts together different parts of animals and is able to concoct a fantastic animal with the head of a cat and the body of a fish, or like a centaur with the body of a horse and the, 
and the and the head of a man and the, and the torso of a man, or like or a siren and so forth. But we are, and even if we watch the alien in Ridley Scott, we can find out that all the pieces the monster in the movie is made of belong to our everyday life. Fangs, teeth, mouth. Yes, of course, their combination may be um, scary, but there's not, there's, there aren't any new colors. Even in virtual reality devices, nobody has ever perceived a new color. So, it seems that our, our mental capacity to create a mental world is limited by the actual world. And why should that be so? My hypothesis is that what we call dream is nothing, or a hallucination, is nothing but the perception of the world, of the actual world, in an unusual combination. How could that be possible? Let me make you an example that I found very convincing from a work of art by Bernard Prass. Bernard Prass is famous to be able to make objects out of everyday objects, as here. So here you may see that there's a collection of everyday objects, a shark, a clock, a keyboard, um, other objects of all kinds, that if seen from this point, oh, from this point, they show, they appear, or they just compose, more properly, what? They compose the face of Salvador Dalí. Now, as far as we know, dreams are just like that. If we analyze the actual content of dreams uh, recorded by um, psychologists, we will find out that most of dreams are just a combination of uh, elements from everyday life and even hallucination for example those triggered by uh, transmagnetic stimulation or by direct electrical stimulation are often a combination of uh, everyday uh, things so if if you if you if you read what people feels when you trigger their brain they report things like i see my mom I see the ballroom where I, I, I was, where I went when I was at, at high school, in, in high school, and so forth. There is almost never anything which is utterly bizarre. And most cases of hallucination are like that. At the best of my knowledge, there are very, very few cases that cannot be explained as a amalgama as an amalgamation of uh, um, previous events or properties or object that we have perceived, just like in Bernard Pras uh, artwork. So what would that mean? That would mean that in memory or hallucination, we perceive our past, but you may say the past does no longer exist. Well, are we sure of that? And let me take you into consideration a slightly different kind of apple. So, but first let's start from the apple. Is the apple in my present? Not literally, because the apple is at least 300 milliseconds from any neural activity in my brain. So in order for the apple to produce an effect in my brain, it needs the, the, the light rays to go from the apple to my eyes. Well, that doesn't take much, but still it takes some time. Then you, you need to wait for the rhodopsin to be released by the photoreceptors. Then you need uh, several layers of activity in the eye, um, T cells, uh, gangliari, amacrine cells and so forth. Then you need the, the, the neural signals, which is very slow. It goes only 100 meters uh, per second, so it's quite slow to, tra to cross, to travel, cross uh, the, 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 the optical nerve, to go through the LGN, and then finally to reach the, the V1, which is not sensitive to color at all. 
And then finally, it needs to get to the V2, V3, and V4, and the like. So, at least 300 milliseconds, which may seem a very short time span, but you realize how long it is if you try to grab a fly. And you will fail miserably. <laughs> Why? Because the fly has an irregular motion that is faster than those critical 300 milliseconds. But that's not that's not where we're gonna stop. Let's suppose that the moon, sorry, that the apple gets farther and farther away. How far away? Well, like the moon. The moon is just a, large, a bigger apple. The moon is one second and a half from us. Still, the moon is in our present. And when we watch the moon, the moon that we see is definitely an object just like the apple. Or what about, for example, the sun? The sun is eight minutes away. Still, it's an object. And it's not true that we don't see the sun, that we see only an image of the sun. Because if it was true that we see an image of the sun, then it would also be true that we see an image of the apple. Because it's only a parochial difference, the fact that the apple is 300 milliseconds from us and the sun, and the sun is eight minutes away. What's the big difference? In fact, the notion, the standard notion of the present as made by the things that take place at the same time, it's false. And this time, I don't need to be on the shoulder of Galileo but they need to be on the shoulder of Einstein. Einstein, with its famous analysis of simultaneity, told us that at any time we are simultaneous, not with the things that take place at the same time, which doesn't exist actually, this now. This is the naive notion of Newtonian now. But with all those objects, wherever and whenever they took place, which are producing an effect at this very moment in our brain. So nothing prevents our present, ourselves, to be made not just by a spread object in space, but also by a spread object or a spread collections of object in time. And actually, that's a fact. We live in a world that is not made of instant, but a world like James and Bergson and many other philosophers and scientists have noted is made of uh, duration, is spread in time as well as in space. And this allows me to take advantage of another fact that we know very well about hallucinations. There are several mechanisms that are able to induce hallucinations. What is surprising is that all, all such mechanisms are all different. We can have hallucination by means of sensory deprivation. We can have hallucination by means of sleep. We can have hallucinations by means of uh, cortical damage because of sensory damage, because of um, uh, for example, uh, drugs. And strangely enough, the drugs that produces the most beautiful hallucination are not the one that uh, increases our neural activity. They're the one that reduces our mental activity. And that's quite surprising. And scientists so far have no explanation as to why our brain in such a condition should bother about creating a virtual wrong, faked version of the external world. There's no reason. Ah, I forgot, phantom limb. That's another way in which we can get a hallucination, just by getting um, sever severing, by, by cutting a limb. 70-80% of people who lost a limb, a big limb or just a finger, or just a, a small part of their body, afterwards have hallucination. There's absolutely no evolutionary-based explanation as to why we should 
have a neural mechanism to provide us with a virtual fake version of the world. But all such mechanisms have something in common. What do they have in common? That they are all cases in which the causal relevance of the uh, proximal world in time and space is reduced. Let me take you the simplest possible case. Sensory deprivation. You go to a room where everything is white, gas and field. You, there are no noises. After a few, an hour or so, you start to have hallucination. So the idea is that when the present, like now, like uh, this guy that was me when I had a beard, who is uh, working on his uh, terrace on uh, the balcony and is watching at the at the Mediterranean Sea with the sun, the constellations, the moon, and everything else. Well, it's just a fantasy. My 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 balcony is not that beautiful, but <laughs> let's suppose that I may work in a place like that. Well, when this body is here, the present is spread to all this object. And it is already spread in time and space. Because these objects, the moon and the sun, are already one second and a half and eight minutes away. So it's already quite spread. But after a while, this guy falls asleep. When one guy falls asleep, it's a little bit like a... a endogenously controlled sensory deprivation. Uh, there is a kind of blockage from uh, the thalamocortical structure and usually we are in a silent uh, place, so we don't get much uh, pressure from the external world. In such a condition, it is the past that is still having a causal effect inside our brain. So at that very moment, what is the event? What are the events that are still producing an effect in our brain at that very moment? Well, my time with my students talking about the rainbow, my Sunday with the bike, my day with my kids uh, playing at the beach, my first kiss, a little bit of romanticism, many, many years ago, and the like. There are still events that are still able to produce a causal effect, they're still able to produce an effect in my brain. How can I say that? The, the simplest possible proof is the fact that right now I am speaking with you about them. That means that my brain had been able not only to be causally affected by them at the moment in which I perceive them, but my brain is also able to allow them to continue to produce an effect several years later. Just like the light is able to allow, for example, the um, Big Reaper constellation to produce an effect, give or take, 60 years later after those stars shone in their place. So, to, to get to the end, and then that, that's really the end, my, my hypothesis is very simple. It suggests to consider ourselves identical with the um, external object rather than with the, the brain. Sorry, let me move a little bit. Rather than with the brain. Why? Because the external objects have all the properties that we need and that we find in our experience of the world. And if we take into consideration the two additional consequences of this theory, namely the fact that the object is always relative and that the object might be wherever and whenever it needs to be, as long as it is still producing an effect in the brain, we can not only explain standard perception, but we can also explain the variability of subjective individual experience and the uh, all cases like uh, uh, um, dreams, hallucinations, sensory deprivation, illusions, phantom limbs that apparently require a mental world. We can find all of that in the 
physical world. Once we reconceive the physical world in a way that is completely compatible with Galileo and with Einstein. So I'm not asking you to, to change anything in what we know about the external world. I'm just asking you to take seriously into consideration what Galileo and Einstein told us about the world in terms of temporal simultaneity and relative existence. We don't need anything else. At least this is my um, radical hypothesis. And I thank you very much. Okay, many thanks for your. There, are, there were quite a few uh, new ideas for me, but I could imagine some of them. Uh, some were a little more easy to understand than others, but that's I guess I guess the case for most of us. Uh, may I now suggest that we we'll take a five minutes break? Uh, Thank you. Legs, and then we come back five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. And afterward, I will be also happy to reply to some questions about uh, your own uh, uh, field of research. Yeah, okay, okay. See you in five you. minutes. Five minutes, thank five you. Five minutes, yes. Now, uh, Hi. Have, have five minutes passed, I think so. So I think we can start. Uh, were there some questions in the chat? I saw a question in the chat. I was reading it. I advise everybody to read the questions. Yeah. It's a very nice question about uh, having a crate of apples of a delicious um, kind, Ingrid Marie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, I love apples too. Yes. <laughs> and um, this the stairs the basement because the apple is already present in my consciousness. I may start salivating in anticipation of sinking my feet into it. Can you explain where is the consciousness look of the apple located when I descend into the basement? Is the brain working as a can? No. Of course not. Let me provide you. A, so, uh, the, the the question is: I anticipate having these delicious apples in my basement, but of course I, I I don't see them yet. But somehow the apples in the basement are present to me. Now let me ask you to Ulf um, a question: How do you know that you have apples in your basement? You saw them the day before, or you saw the guy bringing the apple inside your basement there must have been in the past a moment in which you met those apples or if you didn't meet those apples you met other apples actually maybe the apples in the basement aren't that good after all maybe your anticipation is wrong maybe you think you have very um um, how do you define them? Very tasty apples in the basement, but they went uh, uh, stale because maybe in your basement there, there there was water. I don't know. I hope not. But but you were salivating. You were anticipating. And why did you do that? Because in your past you met apples, and actually. Hep apples are definitely not an innate notion. We are not born with the idea of apples. Although apples are very common on the Earth's surface, there are many um, societies, many, um, many human beings who had never been an apple. An Eskimo, for example, had no idea, had no anticipation of apples. Only after you met apples, you can afterwards have an anticipation of a future apple. But my argument against what you're saying, that you have uh, the apple of the future in your mind, is that actually you have the apple of the past in your mind. And you have a belief about an apple as tasty as the one in your past in the future. So. To cut a long story short, I would distinguish between having an experience and having a belief. I may have a belief about Elon Musk going to Mars sooner or later. Will he succeed? Who knows? I may believe it. I may have a belief about having tasty ap apples in my cellar. Do I really have them? Who knows? Maybe they have been eaten by worms. Maybe they have been stolen. I believe they will be in my future. 
but they won't and I will be sorely disappointed. But there is something that makes me salivate, like the uh, Pavlos, like Pavlov's dog. And this something is not the apple in the future, it's the apple in the past. Okay, Ulf, did you understand that? Do we have any further question? Okay, um, can I keep? Uh... Yes, yes, I, I, I would like to respond to, to this uh, further question. <coughs> Supposing I am right, which is always a good way to start uh, <laughs> every morning. Yes. Supposing that I'm right. <laughs> How does this solve the hard problem? Because you may say, well, after all, everything I said doesn't explain at all why, what's the nature of subjective experience. Actually, it does. And let me, let me tell you why. The hard problem stems from the fact that the properties of the brain aren't like the property of our experience. The property of the brain are of something which is gray, mushy, slightly unpleasant. These properties are completely unlike the properties of our experience. So, if we assume that the properties of our experience are here in the brain, we have the hard problem. The hard problem is finding the properties of our experience where they are not. But let's for a moment take again my hypothesis into consideration. If that's the thing my experience is made of, how can I tell that this thing is not like my experience? How can I tell that the roundness of the apple is not good enough to be the roundness of my experience? How can I claim that the redness of the apple is not good enough to be the redness of my experience? After all, who has ever seen pure mental redness? Have you ever seen pure mental redness next to physical redness to tell that they are different? You haven't. You cannot do that. You are compelled to say that in your experience there is always one redness. This. This redness. The hard problem stems from looking for the redness there or here. If you look for the redness in the brain, you don't find, well, you find the redness because there is the blood, but definitely it's not the redness of the apple. I should make the example with a banana, so we would have yellowness and it would be uh, more simpler to do. But you don't find here the redness of the apple. So you need to introduce here the magic properties of subjective experience, which is something which is there but nobody can see. And we define that the phenomenal, it's phenomenal, it's there but nobody can see it. You can stare it inside a, a brain as much as you like, with fMRI, with EEG, with uh, microscopes, with whatever, and you will never find the properties of your experience. Oh, this is the the, the, the hard problem. Great. Philosophers will have their job forever. They will never get to solve such a problem. But once we shift our identity from the body to the external world, the external world is just like our experience of it. If you describe your experience of the apple, you describe the apple. 
So according to Leibniz, the principle of identity of indiscernibles, once two entities have all in the same properties, the two entities are the same. So in the end, I claim that my mind object identity is based on Leibniz principles of the identity, you see another identity after all, of the indiscernibles, a very difficult word to mean two things which have the same properties. So I think that the hard problem evaporates, disappears. In uh, NDE, yes, uh, near that is claimed to see new colors. Okay, I told you that uh, I, I wasn't against talking about uh, uh, ESP. I'm a little bit more skeptical about um, uh, telekinesis or the other kind of stuff. But on ESP, my theory provides a, a possible uh, physical explanation, which is the following. In everyday life, as we, we all know, the body has, uh, let's say, a um, standard mode of operation. And therefore, the world that causally relative to the body is more or less always the same. Objects, colors. But if we damage or if we bring our body to work in a non-standard way, the world that is causally effective on the body might be different. Not because, it create, not because the body creates anything special inside itself. Because if you look inside the brain of someone who is in near-death experience, you keep finding only neurons, glia and the like. But it may be that in that circumstances, either because of the lack of oxygen, either because of some non-standard mode of operation, either because of whatever happens in a brain in that very moment, all of a sudden we are no longer limited to standard objects. It may be that, that at that very moment a much broader picture of reality is able to be one with ourselves. So it may be that in the moments in which let, let, let me let me make you an analogy from Aldous Huxley, who was not a neuroscientist. He was, a, a, as you know, he wrote uh, uh, Brave New World, uh, uh, The Doors of Perception. He was fascinated by such possibilities. And he used to say that our brain is like a narrow channel. The point of our brain is not to create what we see but to select what we see and to make us able to see or to be, I would say, only those things that are useful in a practical everyday life. So we focus on objects, cars, um, I don't know, money and, and this kind of things, things that are useful. But nothing prevents our brain in uh, uh, unusual circumstances to break down and to allow a larger lake, to use the metaphor of the dam, a larger world to be for a moment one with ourselves. And that might be, I don't know, the light people have experienced at the end of the light or that feeling of oneness with a larger reality. So nothing in my theory prevents the mind to extend or to be spread to a much broader uh, scope in space and time. That would be consistent with my theory. And that would be possible because for a moment we would be, it, it basically it's the same mechanism. When I go to sleep, I'm no longer constrained to a narrow present, to what is happening right now in front of my body. 
but I extend my being to all of my life. And therefore, I dream of being in, in, a, in a garden uh, uh, where, where I was when I was a child, uh, with my family, with my grandmother who's no longer alive, and the like. Why? Because in space-time, those things are still having an effect on my brain. It may be that in NDE experiences, we are just uh, one with a broader world. And it would be interesting to study such experiences from using this conceptual framework and maybe to see whether we can induce them and to see whether we can use this framework to expand what is the standard domain of our own experience, which is usually limited to standard objects. <clears throat> the brain is dead. That's a very good question. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, you see, in this theory, the brain does not need to, to be alive. At the time of the object I have an experience of, it, it is only required that the brain is resuscitated afterwards. <laughs> to tell us. So the brain is dead and remains dead. <laughs> There's no way we, we, we're going to have any, any, any feedback from such an experience. But if the brain is when I say that we are not our body, I mean that literally. So it is possible that even if my brain is dead during a, a certain period of time, I am identical with things that happened before the time in which the brain was dead. As, as long as the brain afterwards starts working again, those things can be one with my experience. So. When I say that I'm not my body, I mean that literally and in a physical sense. So there's no need to have the um, simul uh, simultaneous, no, not simultaneous, the, the, the synchronic existence of a, a, brain, a brain that is alive with the object of one's experience. Because what it is important is that the brain has to be alive afterwards. <laughs> Okay. in order to allow for something to produce an effect but not at the same time do you remember i mean this uh, sorry let me let me use against this slide i said that according to einstein this is a naive view and it's it, it is false in physics this view is false i don't see the sun as it is now i see the sun as it was eight minutes ago if my brain was dead in this time, well, as long as it uh, resuscitates afterwards, it's fine. So, there, so there's no need to be alive. So in this view, being alive is not the same as being conscious. Being conscious is being identical with objects that have uh, uh, a causal relevance now. Okay, let's think about that answer. I notice we have three persons with questions. Laila, you may unmute yourself so that we can hear you. Laila Schildström, did you want any question? I can't hear you because you're unmuted. If it was by mistake, I can have John Pilotti. Laila, you can come back if you have some question. Uh, John Pilotti, did you have a question? That we can hear? Yeah, um, you're muted. You're all muted. <laughs> okay. Ricardo, I've all, all already answered my question. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, did John I have, have a question. question? Yes. I have it. I have a question. Please. <laughs> I'm John Fjellander. <clears throat> I'm thinking about what you said, that you had been working with people who were blind from, uh, from a birth. Uh, then I uh, thought that uh, an interesting question appears. If a person who has been blind from birth uh, experience a uh, near-death experience, 
and experience being outside their own body and observing what is happening in the uh, in in the room and for example there is a red blanket on the bed which they have never seen so they have no mental uh, image or or memory of a red blanket but uh, how would they possibly perceive this red blanket seeing it from outside the body. Do you know any such uh, stories that, that, that blind people uh, having experienced colors? And, and underlying this question is, of course, then also, uh, do we need to have an experience or a memory of something outside ourselves in order to be able to see it? Uh. Yes, uh, in order to have an experience of something in, in this view, we need to have a physical contact with that something in a way that is causally um, relevant. So right now, and I don't believe that a congenitally blind subject, someone born without the eye, just to be 100% sure, I know many people with that uh, um, condition may have in a near death experience any experience of colors for a specific reason that colors don't exist as absolute properties colors are not there colors are something that takes place relative to the structure of a human eye or an animal eye they're not absolute properties. We may have the impression that colors exist absolutely, but they don't. So if someone was born, say, without eyes or with uh, such a severe conditions, colors would have never been a part of uh, his or her environment. So there would not have been any colors to be seen. That's why I don't believe they might have seen something. Because there would not have been anything to be seen. Um, consider this case. Do people with near-death experiences report having had the experience of uh, neutrinos? They don't. Still, there are as many neutrinos around as uh, uh, colored uh, light rays. Do they report infrared? Do they report uh, properties which are taking place in our environment, but which uh, we never refer to in our uh, language? They don't. They report only properties that they have either experienced in their life or that they have heard of from other people in their social group. So for this reason, I don't believe, uh, or at least uh, in all cases that I've been able to check, and I don't think there are many near death experiences in uh, in, uh, in a congenitally blind subject we can refer to. Um, in all cases, uh, I, in all, uh, I, I be, I've been able to, to check personally and thoroughly, um, there seems to be always an identity between the environment and uh, one's uh, experiences. So that, that, that's my answer to this. I don't know whether you're satisfied with that answer. You may be convinced that a congenitally blind, sub, blind subject may have seen colors. But I, I don't think so. They've seen anything like colors. Because there were no colors to be seen if they were not uh, equipped with a body relative to which colors might take place. Cargo, may I come back Please. to my question that, that people near death which are not blind 
they see, see new colors they have never seen. And you, you talked about before that perhaps we can see a broader reality. And by not a blind subject, see a broader reality. It's not limited by the brain, which I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, good point, good point. For example, there is a famous experiment repeated uh, um, several times that was originally done by Crane and Piantanida in uh, 1986 and was repeated uh, recently by a Japanese and by an American group. In these experiments, people are able to see Martian or impossible colors. Let me give you an example. What do they mean by an impossible colors? And why do we know that they saw an impossible colors? We all know that uh, uh, there are color opponents. For example, we know that uh, blue and yellow are opponent. That means that from a, a phenomenological per perspective, uh, there is no intermediate hue between blue and yellow. But there are intermediate hues between other couple of colors. For, ex for example, between red and blue, there is purple or magenta. Between red and yellow, there is or orange. So if we were able to make someone see the intermediate hue between blue and yellow, we would know that we would have uh, been able to see a new novel, a novel color, someone that we usually don't see. Nobody sees anything like that. Well, to cut a long story short, Crane and Piantanida and uh, Balok and other people more recently, they were able to build a contraption that allows the eye to work in a new way. So basically, it allows people to have a new uh, kind of eye that is actually able to pick up frequencies in a unusual and novel way. By doing that, these people report and having an experience of a, a beautiful hue they've never saw before, they've never seen before, intermediate between yellow and blue, just like purple is an intermediate hue between blue and red. In these cases, though, there was a physical structure, the contraption in, uh, uh, that was placed to work together with uh, the subject's eyes that allowed those subjects to extend to colors. So it was a way to make colors happen in the physical world. In the case of a congenitally blind subject, there's no reason why there should be a causal connection between that, um, that um, property, the color, in the world and the brain and the body of the subject. Because the subject of uh, the people on the brink of death would be as blind as, sorry, the body of uh, the subject on the brink of death would be, as far as I can understand, as blind as the body of the subject before being in a near-death experience. So I don't see why a near-death experience should put a body in a condition to perceive a color. When I said that it may expand one's experience, I didn't mean providing him with additional sensory experience. I meant to a broader reality. Broader reality, I meant like the oneness, like the Big Bang, like the origin of everything. So I think that reducing near-death experiences to having some, let's say, additional sensory experiences is all too narrow. In this case, we think we need to think at a larger scale. But of course, this is just my opinion. And I apologize if uh, I may look arrogant in the way in which I reply, but I'm just trying to be straightforward and uh, um, as consistent as possible with hy the hypothesis I started from. Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's a very good start uh, to, um, you have a basic uh, theory and then you try to understand also other strange experiences uh, in certain ways. Uh, Jung Mansocke, do we have a question? You may unmute yourself. 
Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, I have a question about what is carrying our consciousness. Uh, if we uh, uh, have a consciousness with the mind is identical to the objects we perceive, uh, still I'm feeling there should be something carrying this consciousness. What kind of stuff is this of? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I thank you very much because this is a, a very uh, common misunderstanding. So I, I, I need to change the. I, I don't know. I, I think it's something that requires some some uh, thinking. When I claim that to be conscious is a matter of being identical with objects, I thereby get rid of the need of having consciousness as something over and above the physical world. Let, let me put it in this way. We are all very fond of the notion of having consciousness carried by our brain, simply because our brain is not like our consciousness. So consciousness has to be different from the carrier, and there has to be a carrier. That's why we all think that our consciousness is perhaps inside the brain or that our consciousness is carried by the uh, un neural underpinnings but if consciousness is one and the same with the world the world is not carried by anybody do you remember the story of the old woman that asked it to bertrand russell but uh, if the uh, how can the earth not fall down and uh, Russell, to make a joke, replied, well, we all know that the, the earth is uh, put on top of a turtle. And, and the woman said, yes, but why does the turtle not fall down? Who, who carries the turtle? And so that leads to the famous joke, turtle all the, turtles all the way down. So the problem of uh, what carries consciousness, in my view, is a, a pseudo problem. It's a pseudo problem that arises once you assume that consciousness is something different from its carrier. But it is not. The universe is not carried no, by not carried uh, anything. There's no need to, to hold the universe. There's no need to hold the reality. If you are one and the same with the reality, there's no carrier. There is just the reality. We are identical with. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, my PC doesn't give a video anymore. I, I have a problem with the PC, but that's not a big thing. But still, what is the continuity of my consciousness through my different phases of my life? And if I have reincarnation, how do? I, where am I between the different uh, incarnations? Now I. I am not sure about the incarnation. I, I, I hold as a rule not to talk uh, about uh, um, afterlife. I, my theory provides just a consistent framework for uh, uh, this life, this time. And, uh, but since we are uh, towards the end of this uh, webinar and I ask you very much, I will tell you what I believe is afterlife. Uh, that's but that's not my theory that's just my my insight i believe that afterlife is eternity it's not uh, immortality it's not to continue to be alive it's to step out of the temporal dimension and um what's the connection between our life and uh, eternity in my insight our life provides a, a metaphysical existence to eternity. We, by doing our action, we bring eternity into reality. But that's just my guess. So I don't think that we will reincarnate and we will continue to live as we live now. But we think we will kind of be one with the eternal principles of reality. But that's a um forgive me if i uh, um didn't uh, stick to my golden rule never to talk about afterlife 
<laughs> yeah, but my question is then what, how do we, we need, uh, your theory goes as far as it goes, but then it does not cover all human experiences because people, children have experiences of uh, persons who have lived before, uh, very carefully investigated. And uh, we have other phenomena like uh, communication with deceased people, which also happen, uh, are verified and uh, cannot be explained by any other theory. So your theory it needs to be extended for these events. Yes, yes. So far, I haven't. So so far, I, I as I told you, I, I, I so far I hold as a golden rule never to deal with the afterlife. Mm -hmm. I, okay, I can see you. that there are so many levels of challenges for consciousness research. And you both have consciousness itself and having experiences is a very big challenge for most psychologists and researchers. Then there are other kinds of experiences that don't, you don't touch upon, but I mean, then it's, there, there are so many aspects needed to understand consciousness and all, all kinds of experiences. So, I mean, you, you approach some issues in aspects of consciousness and experiences, and also that's also very important. Other people look at other experiences. Yeah, and thank they, you, yes. And maybe uh, work with you later and uh, find possible ways to evolve it and develop it. But I mean, there are so many levels of, of questions. So uh, also this, as it may seem, rather simple simple questions need answers yes yes i totally agree so far consciousness science is very limited and even being able to suggest an answer to the simplest possible cases of consciousness just like the experience of an apple is already would be already a, a big step forward yeah and i believe that my hypothesis is worthwhile because it suggests to look in a completely different direction than most uh, theories around and yeah. uh, it is uh, at its very first uh, stages so we we i mean just the beginning so it, i don't pretend to answer to all questions of course no question of course was there any question from ulf i phone can you see it in the chat? Can you see the question, Ricardo? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was trying to see it. Uh, yeah, would, uh, from Uf. Would it, according to your hypothesis, be technically possible to perceive anything if one assumed that no object whatsoever existed? No, of <laughs> course not. It, in, according to this hypothesis, it's, the answer is no. If there were no world, we would not perceive anything. So, just to, to, to be clear, the uh, often uh, assumed notion of a brain in a vat, according to this theory, is impossible. So a brain in a vat, a perfectly uh, healthy brain that has been kept uh, isolated from the world, according to this hypothesis, would have no experience whatsoever. It would be just a bunch of cells. Okay, yes. Yes. Uh, any more questions? <clears throat> yes, I have one question more. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> um, I have, I've had some <clears throat> experiences of uh, out of the body. And I'll just very briefly explain one to you. So I was <clears throat> sitting at the party, actually, for, for some kind of uh, reason. Don't ask me why. I was sitting down meditating during the party. And then suddenly I experienced that I was lifted up in the air. And I saw the whole compartment with the different rooms from above. And I could see and I could perceive all the people who were there. And I noticed with surprise that uh, there was one boy and a girl dancing very, very tightly to each other. And I had not noticed that they had an interest of, 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 of uh, each other before. So I, I, it was a bit surprised. But 
the strange thing was that suddenly I experienced the boy from inside, how he experienced the girl he was dancing with. And <clears throat> at the same time, I experienced the girl, how she perceived the boy whom she just had met. <clears throat> so <clears throat> uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm, uh, I, I don't know if this is, is, a, is an illusion. Of course, it's quite possible. It's all in my fantasy. <clears throat> but uh, a, an alternative explanation could be that I sort of reached a sort of uh, uh, in total telepathic communications with all the participants, whether I saw them from where I was sitting or in whatever room they were, I had sort of direct experience of them as if I was uh, catching all their thoughts and feelings. Uh, so my question is then, uh, uh, is it possible that we have a kind of perception which goes beyond the brain and that the brain rather is a sort of filter uh, to, 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 uh, to uh, connect us to things that we can see and hear and touch and, and other things we don't normally um, experience, but we, that we in reality uh, the eye, that is the eye, really can experience other things. I've had also some drug experiences, which sort of suggest that if you sort of cut out the brain, you suddenly can have other type of experiences, which at the moment seems as real as any other movement. Well, relative to this specific case, uh, I... I don't think that my theory or the standard uh, dualism make uh, any difference. What I mean is that uh, let's suppose that I was a dualist. In order to explain an out of the body experience like the one that you just described, I would need uh, to add uh, extra um, mechanisms because uh, um, a traditional Cartesian uh, immaterial mind uh, is not uh, able to access other people's minds. So, um, I don't think that it makes any difference whether one is a dualist or whether one is um, a, a standard materialist believing that one's mind is one's brain or, one, or whether one is... Uh, in mind object identity theorist like me in all these three cases one would still explain how another part of the world is accessible to the subject who has an out of the body experience so i this is to say that i don't think that my theory uh, adds or uh, rejects such a possibility any more than uh, other theories about uh, the mind uh, and consciousness do. And at the moment, I would have no explanation of a fact like that, that I take it to be happen. And of course, it might also be a, um, a lucky dream. We, we cannot rule out the possibility that you have some insight about what those boys and girls had in mind or felt uh, and therefore, uh, you had a dream that, like Bernard Pras, a painting put together elements from your past reality into a coherent picture of uh, what was actually happening in the other room between the boy and the girl. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay. Okay, I think we have got rather many questions now. So, uh, did you mention anything about you know, any interest in my research, Ricardo? Uh, sorry, sorry, I was um, distracted you said, by. You said something about being a little curious about my research. Yes, yes. Yeah, I can very shortly mention I, I did my PhD last year. It was accepted for my thesis on true telepathy. Right. Um, so I 
I found that if one twin was exposed to a surprise and another twin was connected to measuring the electrodermal activity, there was a peak on the graph at the very moment of the surprise uh, when this surprise occurred. Uh, one, I had eight time windows. Uh, I picked one by random and there was a significant deviation from chance to find the peak in the right window. So it indicated some kind of communication between the twins that could not be explained by ordinary means since they were far away from each other. So the shock for the organism for one twin was experienced by the other twin. Uh, what is called twin telepathy beneath it was right. It was not mental, but physiological. That was my basic experiments. This was with twins in, in UK. Very, yeah. Um, I am, as, as I replied before to Jan, um, I am, I'm not sure that my theory can provide, actually, I don't think so, that my theory at this stage of development can provide a, any 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 theory because clearly if we suppose the possibility of telepathy we need to look for other mechanisms that may have to do with the either entanglement or the like what yeah. i may say, what i may say about uh, um, telepathy is not much and it, it is mostly related with synchronicity as in other authors namely the fact that if we are identical with the broader world it might be that uh, this world is acting through more than one body. So what we refer to as telepathy is not telepathy in the sense that we are isolated minds able to have some kind of hidden transmission between each other, but it may be reinterpreted as the expression of a common ground to which we all partake. In this view, there would be no longer any need to have, a, let's say, a telepathic exchange of information, but it would be more the outcome of a common overlapping identity with a broader world. Yeah. In this way, people may behave at the same time and say, oh, I behave just like my girlfriend at this very moment, and we are far apart of several thousand kilometers and we must explain that because there is some telepathic uh, hidden transmission going on but the fact may be more like entanglement in, in the case of entanglement the origin of uh, two entangled particles is in common so in a way they share they're the same quantum state so i am providing a macro macroscopical mechanism to share a common ground between different uh, subjects. So when I say that I am a world that speaks through a body, I mean that literally. And it might and, and if we are in the same room, I mean that this world, for example, if we were all in the same room, this world I am made of would partially uh, overlap with yours. And so we would all share uh, to some extent, a common space-time for dimensional manifold. And if that's the case, we could explain uh, uh, telepathy in, uh, as uh, cases of uh, macroscopical entanglement or synchronicity. This is all very imprecise on my side, but I, I, I work it on such possibility on a more detailed uh, uh, aspect in my work, in my books. So yeah. it, it's a possibility that I don't want to rule it out. No, no, I can I can say that many researchers in the field have entanglement as a possible mechanism because there yeah. are obvious similarities, the, the, some kind of direct contact, not transferring information, but then there is some some strange immediate contact uh, between different minds in this in this case. That's a, a little step to an idea, really, at least for some researchers in the field. Yeah. If if I can add one more thing about communication. Yeah. 
uh, because after all, also everyday communication is a little bit mysterious. Because according to Shannon, we transmit information, but we don't transmit meaning. So how is that that we can achieve in successfully transmit meanings and not only information? That's something that even uh, without uh, uh, tele, um, um, uh, telepathic transmission is quite mysterious. As I said that at the beginning, we don't know much. So even being able to explain the simplest phenomena like everyday communication would be interesting. Absolutely. Now, my theory provides a different take on communication too. According to my theory, when we communicate, it's because we succeed to overlap. We are able to uh, partake the same meaning when we are made of the same object. That's why people need to meet, to live together, to have uh, same experiences. And that, I think, is the true meaning of uh, uh, communication is identity, is being able to be identical with the same world. Yeah. And uh, that would reply to share dreams too. Okay, yes, I saw that final question on the chat. Yes, okay. I think we are all very much fed up with new ideas, impressions. Many thanks Thank for you sharing with us. Thank you so much. Okay. And I say bye bye. I'm very grateful and I'm very, um, um, it has been a great experience. I want to say goodbye to everyone. If anybody has any questions, please check my website with my name. You will find it immediately or just write to me and I will be happy to write to any uh, curiosity or uh, um, objections or whatever you want to tell me. Absolutely. It will be a pleasure. Absolutely. All kinds of exchanges. Okay. okay. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, all, all of you. Bye, Jan. Thank you, Jan. Yeah, thank yes. you. <laughs> Bye, guys.